Hello, everyone. My name is Richard Meyer, and I am the Interim Executive Director for the Center for Ethics and Rule of Law, or CIRL, at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. On behalf of the Center, I would like to welcome you to the fourth in our series of book talks this academic year. CIRL is a nonpartisan interdisciplinary institute dedicated to preserving and promoting the rule of law in 21st century national security, warfare, and democratic governance. We draw from the study of law, philosophy, and ethics to answer the difficult questions that arise in contemporary transnational conflicts, as well as interstate challenges to democratic principles. I invite you all to peruse the CIRL blog to read articles and comments about a variety of important issues in the fields of ethics, the rule of law, and the preservation of democracy. To submit a question for today's talk, please use the Q&A feature found on the ribbon at the bottom of the window. Please keep your questions topical and appropriate. Anyone posting inappropriate language or content will be removed. If you are seeking CLE credit for today's event, please note that the CLE codes will be presented twice per hour. Therefore, there will be a total of three CLE codes for this event. Write down these codes and enter them on your digital evaluation form once the event is over. You should have the form already, but if you need another copy, the link will be posted in the chat. The evaluation form is mandatory to receive CLE credits. These codes will tell us how long you attended. The first pass code is January. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's talk, Professor Claire Finkelstein. Claire is the Algernon Biddle Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania. Claire? Thank you so much, Rich. And it's a pleasure to be here. I wish we were here in person, uh, but there are some upsides of our virtual format. I think many of you who have registered today have not been to a CERL event before. Uh, so to all of you and to those of you who have been to our book talk series before, welcome. Uh, I'm delighted today to introduce Richard Painter. Richard is the Walter S. Ritchie Professor of Law at the University of Minnesota. From February 2005 to July 2007, Richard was Associate Counsel to President Bush in the White House Counsel's Office, serving as the Chief Ethics Lawyer for the President, White House employees, and senior nominees to Senate-confirmed positions in the executive branch. In addition to his latest book that we'll discuss today, American Nero, he is the author of Getting the Government America Deserves, How Ethics Reform Can Make a Difference, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2009, Better Bankers, Better Banks, Promoting Good Business Through Contractual Commitment, written with co-author Claire Hill, and Taxation Only with Representation, The Conservative Conscience, and Campaign Finance Reform. Richard is a member of the American Law Institute and is a reporter for the new a ALI Principles of Government Ethics. He has also been active in the Professional Responsibility Section of the American Bar Association. He is the author of numerous op-eds and commentaries and appears routinely on MSNBC, CNN, and other media outlets. Welcome, Richard. Thank you so much uh, for having me today. And I look forward to discussing uh, with everyone uh, my book with Peter Gullenbach, uh, American Nero. And uh, I want to remind everyone that this book went to press in January of 2020. And so the last year of this disastrous presidency is not covered uh, in the book. We hope to uh, cover that in a future sequel, uh, but we can certainly talk about that today as well. Richard, as a lead in to discussing your book, I want to give just a, a few brief remarks about what the country is facing now and the extraordinary events that we've witnessed in the last week to week and a half. Uh, last Wednesday in Washington, D.C., armed insurgents broke into the Capitol building. Uh, some of them apparently had violent intentions with respect to some of our lawmakers. Uh, it was the sense of many in the country that the president himself had inspired them to uh, engage in this act and uh, possibly worse. And as a result, the president has for the second time been impeached and he's been impeached of inciting insurrection. 
There will soon be a trial in the Senate. We have never seen anything like this in our history, a president that has been impeached twice, but even worse, a president who has been impeached for turning his followers against democracy, turning them against the country and trying to upseat the uh, tra peaceful transition of power. Uh, did you think when you were writing this book that this is where we would be <laughs> just a few days prior to Inauguration Day? Uh, I did believe uh, that if Donald Trump uh, were to lose the second uh, election, the re-election uh, that we just had, uh, that it would be very difficult to get him out of office peacefully. Uh, I didn't know exactly what would happen whether he would incite a riot or try to use the military uh, to uh, side with him and take over. Um, he indeed had a meeting uh, in uh, the White House um, talking about using the military to try to redo the election. Uh, we wrote about that in a blog uh, a post for ju Just Security a few weeks ago. Uh, that sedition plan uh, failed. I believe the military has made it clear they wouldn't go along with that. Uh, he went to Plan B, uh, which is this riot, uh, this seditious riot. He told the crowd uh, that there's going to be trial by combat, and that's exactly what happened at Capitol Hill. Uh, this man will do anything to stay in power, and that's his personality. Do you believe, let's start with sort of a basic question, do you believe that when Donald Trump was giving that speech right before the march on the Capitol, that it was his clear intention that his followers actually break into the Capitol building and, and do what they did? Or did he just intend to incite a rousing rally? Well, getting inside Donald Trump's mind is very difficult uh, for most people. Uh, I think he's very psychologically uh, troubled man. Uh, we don't know uh, what he said uh, behind the scenes. We know he said trial by combat. He said words that would incite a riot. Uh, but the fact is that there were people inside the White House who worked with the event planning company that staged that event. I can't believe that we didn't have people who knew there was going to be armed people. Pipe bombs were brought to Washington. I can't believe that the White House didn't know that uh, and that Donald Trump didn't know that this, this crowd was prepared to be violent. And indeed, he did incite them uh, to be violent. Based on the public record alone, I believe there's overwhelming evidence of incitement to insurrection and sedition. And uh, once we dig down into uh, finding out the facts and what communications went back and forth privately, I think it's gonna look even worse for him. Do you think that Donald Trump could be, and do you think he will be, two separate questions, subject to possible criminal charges arising out of these events? Yes, uh, what we have in the public record is probably enough to indict him uh, for incitement uh, of insurrection, inciting violence, uh, just on the public record. Certainly enough to start an investigation and obtain all the emails, communications back and forth uh, between Donald Trump's campaign, uh, people in the White House and the group that was staging this event. Uh, I am very confident that they knew uh, that this was not a peaceful crowd. Uh, and if they knew that the plan was to enter the Capitol building, then they knew that was gonna be violent because there is no way that people were gonna simply be allowed to enter the Capitol building while Congress is counting the electoral votes uh, without having to go through police barriers violently, which is exactly what happened. Uh, yeah, so one I of the things, Richard, that we've been learning about in the last few days um, is the possibility of a kind of widening conspiracy as we look at this. So Democrats are charging that actually Repu some Republican lawmakers may have actually been in on the break into the, to the Capitol. There's a charge that uh, the day before the break in uh, or a few days before uh, some members of the GOP were actually giving tours to some of the same individuals who later broke in. Uh, there's also a, a, a charge that when the insurgents broke in, they knew exactly where they were going, that they were targeting members of Congress. They may have been targeting the vice president. Do you credit these reports and, and how 
broadly do you think we're going to have to look uh, to, to figure out the limits of who exactly was involved and how much planning went into this? We need to look everywhere and find out who was involved, uh, whether it's members of Congress or staff members of members of Congress. I hope it was very few, if any, members of Congress who actually knew that there was going to be a violent takeover uh, uh, on the 6th and then uh, gave reconnaissance tours. Uh, but if that was going on, we need to find exactly who it was. Uh, nothing should be uh, nothing should be ignored. No stone left unturned. We need to find out how broad this conspiracy was uh, to take over the Capitol building. This is the way uh, democracies come to an end in many countries. Is there's a takeover of the Capitol building uh, of uh, the country by extremists who then, uh, after staging a riot, want to put somebody else in power. Uh, it's a very very dangerous precedent to allow this type of a attempted coup in the United States. Uh, we need to find everyone who was involved. Yeah, one of the things that you talk about in the book, so now let's cover things that are that are a little bit uh, closer to home in, in your text. Um, but one of the really interesting chapters that you talk about is, is Nazi Germany in the 30s and, and not to be too inflammatory here, but one of the striking features, uh, we might not have had this conversation uh, a week ago, a little over a week ago. One of the striking features here is the suggestion that there's sort of um, an official hand in this, right? Not only Donald Trump, but we've just talked about Republican lawmakers. And there's also some interesting information coming out about re the uh, Republican Attorney General Association um, and various uh, not-for-profits that they may be in, involved in, uh, one I believe called the Rule of Law Association, uh, no relationship to the Center for Ethics <laughs> and the Rule of Law. Um, but uh, when you look at Nazi Germany, one of the things that you find is uh, a growing movement, which is a uh, fringe movement, not a majority of the population, slowly coming into power. What are the parallels here? And are there any parallels? The parallels are quite frightening. And even before uh, what happened last uh, week. Uh, but uh, remember, in 1923, uh, there was a coup attempt that was really uh, thought of as a joke. And indeed, looked like a joke compared with what happened in Washington, D.C on the 6th of January of this year. In 1923, uh, Corporal uh, Adolf Hitler went into a beer hall in Munich, a beer hall full of politicians, and they've been drunk politicians or whatever, shot a pistol into the ceiling and said, okay, we're gonna have a coup. We're gonna take over uh, Germany here. And uh, uh, you know that, how do you take over a country by trying to take over a beer hall full of politicians? Uh, it, it folded pretty quickly. And they in, indicted him and put him away in prison in Landsberg prison. They sentenced him a couple of years. He ended up only doing nine months time for that. Uh, but people just laughed it off and said that, uh, you know, this is not gonna really happen and, and we don't need to worry about the guy. Well, he gets out of prison and uh, then things are continuing to deteriorate in the economy and so forth. And the German industrialists uh, thought that they could use him uh, and uh, that, you know, they didn't necessarily sympathize with all his fascist views, but they could use him to fight back against the left, against socialism, against communism and all that. And before you know it, he was able to put together 33% of the vote. That's all it took uh, to get himself appointed chancellor of Germany 10 years later. Uh, so uh, this type of a, uh, of a coup attempt, someone is willing to use violence to try and seize control of government these types of people, you don't just laugh at it and say, well, they had goofy costumes and, uh, you know, we're not going to worry about it because they come back and they may not come back with Donald Trump. I mean, he may be too old for this coup business pretty soon, uh, but there's Donald Trump Jr. and there's Eric and there are, there are several senators. You know, one of the United States senators fist pumping these uh, protesters, uh, Senator Hawley of uh, Missouri, uh, you know, encouraging this uh, violence. Uh, and some of these younger folks who come along in a, in a decade or so, or even sooner than that. And uh, it, it could be a very, very dangerous situation. 
And we uh, do know that that Senator Hawley has presidential ambitions, very likely that Ted Cruz has presidential ambitions. So it may not be Donald Trump himself, as you suggest, but uh, wanting to run for office again in, in 2024, though he said that he may. Um, but it could be one of these other individuals who might be a more effective uh, dictator than Donald Trump has been able to be. How worried should we be about that? I'd be very worried about it. And the, the question for the Republican Party is going to be where they want to return to uh, uh, traditional conservatism. Uh, and what's going on here really doesn't have that much to do with the left-right spectrum, although it's obviously taking place in the United States now on the far right. Uh, but uh, one alternative is traditional conservatism, where you can be as conservative as you want on policy and hear your views on issues, but you respect elections. Uh, you also respect objective truth. Uh, this whole notion that there's no such thing as objective truth, which uh, permeates uh, extremist thought uh, on both the left and the right. But uh, the, the difference is in the United States, it, it's only had an impact in the political system on the far right. Uh, the idea of alternative facts and all that, that has nothing to do with traditional conservatism. That is uh, a whole brand of politics, which is much closer to what happened in Germany in the 19. Uh, 30s uh, than uh, even the most conservative uh, political um, uh, leaders who've been elected and then they're willing to uh, acknowledge defeat. Let me take Barry Goldwater in 1964. Uh, he was ultra conservative and gave some firebrand speeches, but when he lost, he lost and uh, he respected that. Uh, and if the Republican Party doesn't want to go back to the philosophy of Ronald Reagan and uh, Barry Goldwater and, and maybe a few moderates. I was a moderate Republican for many years, throw some moderates in the mix to have a little diversity. Uh, but if they want to go this route of uh, bringing in uh, extreme uh, people who don't respect objective truth, to glorify violence uh, and say the violence is acceptable, uh, that's just not a political party that can function within a representative democracy. Yeah, and indeed, we, we are seeing a kind of upheaval in the Republican Party. And, and of course, uh, Mitch McConnell and Senator Graham and the more traditional uh, conservatives, as much as they may have contributed to keeping Donald uh, Trump in power the last four years, as much as they may have been willing to further his agenda, uh, right at the end, of course, when, when Donald Trump was attempting to uh, reject our democratically elected uh, next president and the peaceful transition of power, they, they put their feet down and uh, have, have said enough is enough. Uh, and, and so does that give you some hope about the future of the Republican Party and that it may be, I don't want to call Mitch McConnell a moderate, but at least uh, you know, a, a segment of the GOP that is willing to abide by the traditional democratic processes. Well, yes, and I think if we're calling Mitch McConnell a moderate, we've really gotten ourselves into a pretty into some <laughs> trouble here, right? Situation. <laughs> He's definitely represented the right, uh, you know, very very conservative wing of the Republican Party, uh, and then we used to have moderates and uh, people like myself and. Uh, a former governor, Arnie Carlson of uh, Minnesota. I was just on the telephone with him this morning talking about some lobbying and PAC money scandals at the university. But we talked to, we've been talking back and forth about Donald Trump for four years. Uh, Bill Weld of Massachusetts, a former governor. Uh, many people opposed Donald Trump from the very beginning. Mitt Romney said that Donald Trump was a fraud in 2016. Uh, some of those people stayed in the Republican Party, like Mitt Romney, others left. Uh, but uh, the Republican Party, if they want to uh, participate in a uh, representative democracy, need to bring uh, some of those more moderate people back and then, and then have the Mitch McConnells of this world, who are the very, very conservative uh, uh, politicians of the Barry Goldwater brand, uh, but who at least, uh, you know, do respect democracy. And that's the key. I mean, there is a, going back to your analogy of, uh, uh, you know, comparison to what happened in Germany, there's a big cons difference between an arch conservative uh, uh, President Paul von Hindenburg and a fascist Adolf Hitler. Now, the problem is what happened in Germany is that the Hindenburgs of this world 
uh, eventually just caved in and went along with it. Indeed, Hindenburg appointed uh, Chancellor Hitler in 1933. And so uh, if the Mitch McConnells of this world uh, want to uh, depart from traditional conservative politics and kowtow uh, to extremism uh, and to this type of rhetoric and, and violence uh, and condone it, uh, then the Republican Party is in a lot of trouble. And I am very much hoping that uh, Mitch McConnell, as the now minority leader, who's probably pretty upset about that, will vote to convict Donald Trump of insurrection. Yeah. Now, uh, what do you think explains the unwillingness of Republicans to stand up to Dr Donald Trump before? Uh, we can look first at, at the Congress. It's extraordinary that there hasn't been more dissension within the party and that it's hung together so tightly that Mitt Romney was the only Republican uh, to vote for conviction with the last impeachment. There's some signs that may be different this time. But it, they've still been amazingly united behind this man. And, um, and it's, not, it's not clear what is causing that. One of the things that's come out in the last few days is reports of, of members of Congress talking about just how afraid they are to go against the, the far, far right of the party, how they literally fear for the safety of their families um, Liz Cheney, since she came out uh, in favor of impeachment, uh, has been attacked by many in the GOP uh, and attacked by, you know, sort of followers, the far right followers and, and the sorts of people who broke into the Capitol building. So what, what explains this? How can we understand this shift in the party and the consolidation of power behind Donald Trump? Well, there are a number of things going on. One is we do have these violent extremist groups that people are scared of right now. My state representative uh, uh, told me just uh, yesterday that uh, there was a so-called protest outside of this house, 70 people uh, here in West St. Paul, Minnesota, and the 70 people showing up, some of them armed outside his house talking about the stealing of the election. Uh, and people are uh, scared, uh, people of, of all political uh, persuasions. Uh, very scared of these people. Uh, I dealt with it four years ago uh, when I came out against Donald Trump and uh, the, uh, the gun rights groups uh, were going around uh, uh, putting up a bunch of uh, a pro uh, a propaganda out there uh, with my picture at a, at a target or something. I mean, that kind of thing. Um, uh, you know, it, these people are really quite dangerous. So there's that- What's happened here? This is surely a, a development a shift in the last four years, right? I mean, we were not talking about people fearing for their lives four years ago. Not as much. There was some of it going on. Uh, you know, I, I, as I, said, I got a little bit of it uh, in October 2016 uh, because I was on TV all the time going after, after uh, Trump, but uh, nothing like this, absolutely nothing like this. But remember, Donald Trump at his rallies in 2016 uh, said, if there's a protest at the rally, you can rough him up a bit. Uh, he was encouraging that. That's right. Uh, and the whole brown shirt routine, I mean, they didn't wear brown shirts, but it's the same idea, you beat up the protester. Uh, so he, he's been buying into this for quite a while and it's accelerated. The other problem though we have to confront is the president of the United States is uh, the head of his political party uh, or her political party. When, and so Joe Biden will be head of the Democratic Party. And when you, the president is head of the political party, that means the campaign fundraising that goes on through the political party, a lot of it, where that money goes is controlled by the president. So we had two Republican senators uh, Corker, Tennessee, and Flake of Arizona, who were very anti-Trump in the 2017 timeframe. And they just decided not to run for re-election in 2018 because Trump was going to primary him and he had the money to primary him. Right. Uh, so yeah, campaign finance is, is going to be part of our story here that we've got to fix that system. Right. So let's talk a little bit about going back the first impeachment. Uh, and, and what went wrong with that impeachment? Uh, as you know, I wrote a, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times saying that the Democrats were wrong to try to rush this over to the Senate, uh, that they should have taken their time. And, and one of the reasons I argued that is 
that I thought the most important thing that we could get out of it was the discovery. Uh, there is no way the Democrats were going to win that one. Donald Trump was not going to be removed. But if they had stretched out the impeachment proceedings, they might have had a shot at uh, getting witnesses through the court system, compelling witnesses, getting documents, and uh, most notably the Trump v. Mazars decision that said that Congress didn't have a legitimate legislative purpose for getting its hands on Donald Trump's tax returns and other financial documents, that might well have come out the other way. Well, yes, you're exactly right on that. And uh, what happened with the first impeachment is the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, was very reluctant to open a formal impeachment inquiry. And uh, what we see from the Mazars decision uh, from uh, June of the, this year, or, 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 or last year, 2020, what we see from the Mazars decision is that the Supreme Court says, if you want to go get those documents from Donald Trump, particularly his personal documents, you got to have a very good reason in Congress. But one reason would be in an open impeachment inquiry. So if they had started an open impeachment inquiry soon after uh, the Democrats got control of the House, I believe they should have started when the Republicans controlled the House, but they were too uh, timid to do it. But they'd started it back in uh, March or so of 2019, uh, they could have gone after the financial conflicts of interest. They clearly would have won uh, the documents they, they won in the Mazars case. That case would have gone the other way if they had had an open impeachment inquiry. So all those Trump doc financial documents, uh, a lot of stuff they, they would have got. The, the unredacted Mueller report, I mean, we get the Mueller report, but all the good stuff about the Russians has been taken out by Bill Barr. Now, there may be the... <laughs> Attorney General next week, we'd have a new Attorney General might fix that. But uh, that's what they should have done. They should have opened the impeachment inquiry early on. It's clear that Donald Trump had committed impeachable acts long before the Ukraine call. Then we had the Ukraine call. See, then what happened is uh, Speaker Pelosi said, well, um, you know, now we've got to impeach. I guess we have to. So she wanted to get it over with because uh, you know she worried about the uh, swing district Democrats, including my congresswoman here in the second district of Minnesota. And so let's just do it quickly, get it over with. Uh, and then that's exactly the, uh, the mistake that you're talking about here, that what, what happens when it rises in the Senate? Mitch McConnell says, uh, no witnesses, we don't need witnesses. I guess we'll have Alan Dershowitz or somebody get up and give a lecture to the senators on the innocence of Donald Trump and then all vote along party lines and be done with it. And that wasn't a trial at all. Now, it looks like, of course, those documents are going to come out anyway, because the Trump v. Vance case uh, went uh, in a very different direction, though actually I do believe the two cases are, are consistent. And you and I filed uh, on behalf of Searle a, an amicus brief in the Trump v. Vance case uh, saying that a sitting president could be indicted and at the very least investigated. Um, but uh, Cyrus Vance won that case. And so Donald Trump presumably, uh, or rather his, uh, his accounting firm, Mazars, has had to turn over all of those financial documents uh, to a grand jury. Now, because it's grand jury proceedings, those proceedings are secret. But are we ever going to see those financial documents? So, better see them soon. And I, I believe that the, the uh, uh, Congress can go back and get them now. Um, the, uh, although they did not impeach uh, Donald Trump or anything having to do with his finances, uh, but I believe that he would lose some of the protections uh, of the presidency uh, next week. Uh, and uh, the uh, New York Attorney General should be able to get them. Uh, grand jury materials, of course, you can't see. Uh, those can't be leaked. Uh, the New York Times got a hold of some of his tax returns showing he paid almost nothing in taxes. Uh, and uh, uh, he's been playing that game. I wrote in a, an op-ed Newsweek about that, where they are, he plays this uh, avoidance evasion game with taxes. He's been doing that for years. And uh, the bottom line is that uh, this is all information that should have been in the public arena uh, to begin with. We should have had a president who, dis who, who disclosed his tax returns. Uh, we should have this information about our president. There needs to be a lot more transparency. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to have to investigate what happened. We can't just walk away from this. Right. Uh, so if we make that argument about this impeachment, then 
what would follow is the Democrats ought to throw a few more charges in there, impeach them on other things, and then not be in a rush to conduct the trial, uh, get it over to the Senate once they've sort of got their ducks in a row, and then try to get as much information as possible, as many witnesses as possible, uh, get as many former cabinet members in there and as many documents as possible. What's, is, is that a, a right theory or a wrong theory on this time around? That we should do that. And uh, the, the idea that we can't do that in the Senate and also uh, uh, carry out other business is, is nonsense. Uh, uh, they can also look at uh, President uh, Biden's uh, 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 legislative agenda uh, as well. Uh, you can have investigations going on with committees of the House and Senate uh, looking into what happened in the Trump administration, uh, just as we did after 9-11. And we investigated what happened there and uh, what happened at Pearl Harbor. I mean, this has been a major event in American history, what happened on the 6th of January. Uh, we need to understand what went wrong in this presidency. Uh, and uh, not all of it will result in criminal charges. Maybe not all of it is going to result in a conviction. Uh, some of it, I believe, should result in a conviction and impeachment trial of Donald Trump. Uh, but we need to have a thorough exposure of what happened here so we can make sure it never happens again. One of the uh, very interesting chapters in the book has to do with Trump and Russia. Uh, and you reproduce key sections of the Steele dossier. Uh, more has sort of come out about that since the, the uh, book went to press, I believe. Uh, what's your feeling about the relationship between Donald Trump and Russia? And would, if when we're going to follow this theory, um, would it make sense for the House to consider additional charges relating to the first part of the Mueller report, which Mueller may have intentionally teed up for impeachment, though he declined to say that the president could be uh, indicted of a conspiracy uh, with Russia. Yeah, the first part of the Mueller report, uh, of course, a lot of it's redacted uh, in terms of what went on with the Russians. Uh, but uh, Robert Mueller was told only investigate criminal uh, activity, a criminal conspiracy. And uh, as you know, as a criminal law expert, uh, conspiracy, criminal conspiracy, it could be difficult to prove particularly in these situations where you have somebody like the Russian operatives who's very good at doing what they're doing on their own. Uh, the Russians don't need the help from a bunch of, of bungling Trumpers to figure out how to hack into computers. Uh, they're very good at that and giving it to WikiLeaks, infiltrating social media. Uh, the Russians have been doing this for decades, uh, uh, it, it, trying to influence elections and in representative democracies, going all the way back to the period after World War I when the Bolsheviks were playing these games and often playing both sides. So they didn't need the Trump campaign to engage in any criminal conspiracies. The, uh, the Trumpers got a, head, a heads up as to uh, what was going to be given to WikiLeaks and when. I think Roger Stone knows about some of that, but he's been conveniently pardoned, so keep his right. mouth shut. Flynn is another one conveniently pardoned, so he'll keep his mouth shut. Uh, so there may very well not be a provable criminal conspiracy. Uh, uh, Robert Mueller was not able to interview Donald Trump, and if he had, Donald Trump probably would have lied. Uh, but that's a, another thing. We've got to investigate this. It's not just about uh, the impeachment trial of Donald Trump. It's about the exposure of the United States to influence of our Roger elections. He could be forced country. to testify now, though, I take it, Richard, because... First, he had a sentence commuted, um, but now he's been pardoned, which means that he cannot claim the privilege against self-incrimination with regard to any of those charges uh, for which he's been pardoned. Couldn't he be forced to testify in a, in a Senate trial? I believe we could force him. Yes, we could. Uh, both Roger Stone and, and Michael Flynn. But that's not going to happen, of course, if the, if the House just sticks to incitement to insurrection. Uh, no, but the, you could have a Senate committee that should be investigating uh, the uh, and a House committee, uh, the uh, interference in the election. And once again, Robert Mueller's report was limited to criminal activity right. and provable criminal activity. We're concerned about a lot more than that. And so you may have had, we obviously know there was criminal activity by the Russians, uh, but we need to know what Americans knew about that, even if Americans didn't commit a crime. 
I didn't haul him in to testify. Now, then again, the value of Roger Stone and Michael Flynn testimony, I don't uh, put a very high value on their telling the truth. I mean, Roger Stone is rumored to have a tattoo of Richard Nixon on his back. Uh, I think that shows you where he's coming from. <laughs> um, one of the things that you and I have, have written about is obstruction of justice and the second half of the Mueller report. And though Mueller concluded that there were not indictable offenses uh, coming out of the first half, uh, the second half, he came much closer to saying that there were, there is this principle in the Justice Department based on uh, several Justice Department memos saying that a sitting president cannot be indicted. And Robert Mueller gave that as the reason why he did not look into whether or not he could indict Donald Trump for obstruction of justice. Um, but that is something that the Democrats could return to. With the, with the first impeachment, it was, an, it was obstruction of Congress. Should they throw a charge of uh, obstruction uh, of justice there and use the second half of the Mueller report and things we've learned since then, which is fairly considerable uh, to, uh, to look at another possible impeach impeachment charge? Yes, they, they could do that. Uh, the alternative, or maybe in addition, is to simply have an independent prosecutor appointed, which I've urged before all this second impeachment talk started, and uh, an independent prosecutor, not a political appointee, and look at the second part of the Mueller report. The second part of the Mueller report is a, a wonderful outline of an indictment of Donald Trump for obstruction of justice. Uh, and Robert Mueller makes it very clear that the reason he didn't indict was this uh, um, DOJ policy that they just won't indict a sitting president, even though there's no constitutional basis for that argument that you can't indict a sitting president. DOJ just says a matter of policy, it's inconvenient, they won't do it. And they've been saying that ever since the Nixon years, and they said it again in the Clinton years, and these two OLC memos. Uh, well, he's not a sitting president anymore. Uh, and the second issue uh, we see in the second part of the Mueller report is that Donald Trump's lawyers made an argument, and it was an argument supported by William Barr, a private attorney, in a 19-page memo to Mueller saying that his obstruction of justice theory was no good because the President of the United States, under Article II of the Constitution, has the authority to fire the FBI director whenever he wants. If he wants to end an investigation, he can end an investigation in effect, that, that the president of the United States is so powerful under Article II uh, that he, he controls the investigation and he can't obstruct himself. <laughs> and that's the Bill Barr theory. That is juxtaposed uh, really very much completely different from what uh, Bob Mueller says in part two. Bob Mueller comes down squarely on the side of rejecting those types of arguments in saying that the constitutional Article II arguments, that this is acceptable conduct for a president, that this is within presidential power, this uh, unitary executive theory it's referred to in the academic literature. I, I don't know if Bill Barr brings that phrase up, uh, that this uh, just can't be taken to that extreme. Bob Mueller is exactly right on that. Uh, so that part two of the Mueller report I believe that a good law student could in a couple of hours probably turn that into an indictment to get by a DC grand jury. And that, that may be the way to go. Yeah, and indeed, Richard, in, in several op-eds that you and I have published together, we looked at um, the arguments in the Trump v. Vance case and the arguments of the lawyers, in particular in the Second Circuit, Trump's lawyers actually argued that he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and uh, not be subject to arrest or investigation or any kind of criminal process. And that's kind of the limiting case of this expanded version of Article II powers uh, that we've really seen grow under this presidency. Indeed, and, and it's very dangerous. And, and you've got two different uh, strands here, uh, two different sets of arguments. Uh, going on. And one of them is this idea that a sitting president can't be indicted for anything so long as he's a sitting president. The other is that even after he leaves office, there's certain things a president does that are just A-OK, -okay, and you couldn't indict him because it's within his Article II powers to, for example, fire James Comey, fire Robert Mueller if he wants, 
uh, Nixon firing Archie Cox and the, the, water, the Saturday Night Massacre, that all that's acceptable conduct for presidents. You couldn't even indict him for obstruction of justice after he left office under this, uh, uh, this second strand of thought in unitary executive theory. Uh, gone array. Uh, and this has nothing to do with the traditional unitary executive theory. It has to do about pointing people to various agencies. Right. This is a very extreme version. But let me just play out the, the dangers of this, particularly the idea that president can't be indicted while he's in office. You say a president can't be indicted when he's in office. It means he can, can't indict him for anything. And President Trump's lawyers show up in the Second Circuit, as you correctly refer to the oral argument, and they said, if he shot someone on Fifth Avenue, they could not arrest him. They could not indict him. Uh, they wouldn't be able to ask him questions, investigate the crime until after he left office. The Second Circuit rejected that argument. Trump versus Vance, the Supreme Court of the United States rejected that argument, um, that that would be, uh, that, 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 that a president could do that and not be indicted. Uh, what if it gone the other way? What if a president could do that, kill somebody, and then not be indicted, not arrested until after he left office. Well, how do you stay in office the old fashioned way? Ask Vladimir Putin. And it goes back centuries. Uh, we've seen it. Uh, Shakespeare's play Hamlet It's about a king who uh, murders a Hamlet's father in order to become king, King Claudius. And then what does he do? He makes it clear to Hamlet, he better not investigate him. He's going to be, he's going to poison the wine of the investigator here. Uh, you know, this is an old problem. Uh, you have people in power who will do anything to stay in power, and that includes killing people. Now, or, Donald Trump has not killed anybody or threatened to kill anybody. Uh, he's, he has other ways of staying in power. Call the president of Ukraine and get him to investigate Joe Biden or whatever. Uh, but if we accept this idea that a sitting president can't be indicted, uh, at some point, uh, we're going to uh, have somebody who uh, takes the Vladimir Putin playbook seriously, and, and the uh, political opposition just conveniently disappears. And short of that, of course, we've seen Donald Trump's call to the Georgia Secretary of State telling him to come up with 11,000 more votes and reverse the certification of the Georgia election. Uh, we've seen uh, Donald Trump uh, threaten people and try to prevent them from testifying. Uh, we've seen uh, a potentially uh, incitement to riot and in incitement to, uh, to his supporters to invade the Capitol building. So that does seem to suggest that the idea that a sitting president can't be indicted could at least potentially be playing a role in allowing presidents to, to do anything they want to try to hang on, on to power. And of course, the more they do that subjects them to uh, criminal penalties after they leave office, the greater incentive they have to break the law now to stay in office another four years. Well, yes, this idea the pre sitting president can't be indicted, it's circular logic because then he commit any crimes he wants in order to stay in office. And what we've seen, yes, he's calling the, the Georgia Secretary of State there, that's a felony. Uh, uh, President Trump calls up and tries to uh, 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 solicit election fraud. That's a felony in Georgia. I recommend they went down for that disastrous Senate campaign in Georgia. The state troopers ought to should have just picked them up and for questioning. Uh, 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 so this president is uh, calling the president of Ukraine and saying you get a couple of hundred million dollars worth of military aid if you investigate Joe Biden. Uh, I mean, that's a bribe right there. Uh, these are criminal acts. And uh, the end of the road is uh, that that hypothetical of shooting someone at Fifth Avenue is not beyond the realm of imagination in some future presidency if we accept this. And this is where the founders, I, uh, you can't imagine that the founders would have uh, em embraced the notion that a president uh, couldn't be indicted for crimes in an office when it was known at the time of the founding uh, that that's how uh, uh, kings and others had gone into office and stayed in office by killing off the pretenders. That's why I mentioned the, the, the Shakespeare plays and their examples from the Roman Empire. I mean, the founders were aware of all that. There's no way they would have signed off on that theory. Uh, and indeed, there was a discussion. It's in uh, uh, William McClay's diary uh, that we mentioned in the uh, amicus brief we filed with the court 
Senator William McClay of Pennsylvania, one of the first, um, uh, he's the first Congress, 1789, uh, and they were arguing about, could you, uh, you know, can you indict a president, um, you know, if he shot someone in the street? Uh, and uh, uh, McClay made it pretty clear that a lot of people in, in Congress with a view of the president, just like anybody else, could be charged with a crime. Uh, and uh, we had some fun in that brief because the Solicitor General of the United States uh, went into the Supreme Court and cited McClay's diary for the precise opposite of what McClay believed. Uh, and uh, we, we had to ta take him down to size there. So how do we get the unitary executive theory, which has, has grown so out of proportion from a theory about legitimate removal powers on the part of the president to a, an overall interpretation of Article II, how do we start cutting this down to size? And one of the things to think about is the role of the Attorney General here. Uh, we also, you and I led a, a small commission to, to study the role of the Attorney General and, and in particular Bill Barr uh, and how he led the Justice Department uh, in the period of his tenure. And uh, we found a number of abuses of office and ways in which Bill Barr was supporting this authoritarian mindset. What can be done going forward to, to try to get a, a different approach, a different way of thinking about both presidential and, uh, and Justice Department power? This is something I'm hoping for from the Biden administration, uh, although it's gonna be counterintuitive to persuade a president uh, to scale back on presidential power. And uh, for example, the uh, Office of Legal Counsel opinions that say a sitting president should not be indicted. Uh, the one from the Nixon era and the second from the Clinton era. Both of those opinions should be rescinded and uh, replaced with an Office of Legal Counsel opinion that a sitting president is just like anybody else and could be indicted for any crimes. Uh, I think in Joe Biden's case, if he's got one or two traffic tickets, he can go ahead and pay them off. And they're probably just a parking ticket. He has nothing to worry about. Uh, we need to make it clear, the president is not above the law. And uh, that's what President Biden should do. Uh, and scale back on this so-called unitary executive theory. No more arguments that the president of the United States could obstruct justice. Uh, uh, by removing an uh, FBI director, or the United States attorney in the Southern District of New York, which happened this summer in the middle of a bunch of investigations that uh, Donald Trump didn't like, and uh, get out and officer legal counsel opinion on that, that uh, regardless of Article II powers of the president, uh, any attempt to remove a prosecutor or an investigator in order to impede the investigation is itself a criminal offense, a violation of the obstruction of justice statute. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that uh, President Biden could be a very strong president, but also take a hard line against extremist interpretations of presidential power, uh, which got us into this mess. Uh, because at some point, we may have a president who is similarly inclined uh, to Donald Trump, I hope never. Uh, but we better have the legal guardrails in place saying, nope, you can't do that. One of the things he could do is discuss with Merrick Garland the possibility of pulling those memos, uh, saying that a sitting president can't be indicted. Um, but there's another aspect of this we should discuss briefly, and I see the questions are piling up, so pretty soon I'm going to uh, read off some of the audience questions. But another thing that we should talk about briefly that intersects with this is the pardon power, because even if uh, Merrick Garland as attorney general were to pull those memos and say, we're not standing by that anymore. And to try to refine the advice about when a president can be criminally investigated and when not. Uh, there would always be the issue of a president engaging in a self pardon. So first of all, do you think we're likely to see that between now and next Wednesday? I would never want to predict what, what happens under Donald Trump. Uh, it's just six more days, and uh, I hope we never have to worry about him again. He may try a self-pardon. He's asked about it. Uh, I wrote an op-ed uh, with Norm Eisen and Larry Tribe uh, about this in the Washington Post, saying that uh, a self-pardon is a no-go. I believe we're right. Larry Tribe is one of the top experts in the country in constitutional law. 
uh, look at it this way. If you allow a self-pardon, uh, you are once again allowing a president to do anything the president wants to do in order to stay in power or in order to enrich himself from his office and then just give himself a pardon on the way out the door. Uh, and that is, it cannot possibly be that uh, the founders would have intended uh, to give the president of the United States that type of a free pass. Uh, remember, we fought the um, American Revolution against the royal uh, power of King George and a parliament in which we did not have uh, representation. The last thing we would have wanted would be to bring in another king uh, who could do anything he wants in office and then pardon himself. So arguably, this shows the beauty of our federal system, because, of course, Donald Trump can't pardon his way out of state crimes or crimes in the District of Columbia, for example, because the D.C. criminal code is not federal. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so even if he tries to pardon himself, the, the state charges would proceed. And I believe uh, that the courts would rule that a self-pardon is, uh, is invalid with respect to the federal crimes. Uh, but we don't even need to think about that with respect to New York, uh, Georgia. He's got a solicitation of election fraud uh, account probably down there waiting for him. And uh, inciting that riot in D.C. is uh, uh, chargeable in the District of Columbia, and they can impanel a D.C. jury and, and see what the jury thinks of that. What about the problem of a preemptive pardon? Because at this point, there are no federal charges against Donald Trump. So if he were to try to pardon himself in the next six days, he'd have to do so preemptively. Is there any reason to think quite apart from the self-pardon issue that a preemptive pardon would be a problem? Now, the preemptive pardons, preemptive pardons before the actual charges are filed uh, are generally respected with Nixon. There were no charges filed against Nixon in 1974 and, the, and uh, uh, President Ford pardoned him and then they didn't file charges. Uh, so I think that they the pardon before the charges are filed is probably valid, uh, but the pardon um, that it comes before a crime would not be. So what he cannot do is pardon himself or others for any future crimes they may commit. Right. Uh, that type of preemptive pardon would be completely invalid. Uh, and then as uh, Larry Tribe and Norm Eisen and I said, a self-pardon would probably be invalid as well. So if, if he became convinced that he wanted to pardon himself, but he's worried about a self-pardon holding up, wouldn't the smart thing to do be to, to strike a deal with Pence to resign and get himself a pardon in the next six days? He could, but then he doesn't have a deal with the New York Attorney General, with Cy Vance, with the state of Georgia. Uh, he's got some problems. Uh, I, I believe you, you tweeted out a story where there's talk about whether he's a flight risk. Uh, uh, I don't know whether um, uh, Mr. Snowden is the only person they want to have over there as a guest of the Russians. Uh, I don't know what he wants to do. but. Uh, if he stays here in the United States, he's subject to state charges right away, pardon or no pardon. Richard, one more topic before we let in the questions from the audience is, what do you, what do you think we can expect on January 20th? How serious is the threat of violence that we're facing? I know that uh, unlike the preparations for the 6th of January, apparently 20,000 National Guard troops are, are planning uh, to be in place for the inauguration. And, and that makes more federal troops uh, on the ground to protect ourselves from other Americans and to protect lawmakers from Americans than we have in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. Yes, we've never had to have this type of security uh, in Washington, a military deployment in Washington for domestic uh, 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 unrest purposes uh, since the Civil War, even, even the, the very challenging, difficult periods of the 1960s uh, did not see anything coming even close to this. Uh, and uh, we will hope that the inauguration uh, goes peacefully. I believe they're going to shut down some roads into Washington, D.C., uh, so people can't just come in there from all over you know, bringing their uh, guns and the rest of it. Uh, so I, I hope that this is going to go well. It's going to go peacefully. 
but it is very worrisome uh, that for the really the first time in, uh, in American history, uh, we have to worry about whether the inauguration of the president is gonna be a safe event for the president, the vice president, and those in line, the line of succession. So what's gonna happen to this far right uh, fringe of the Republican Party and, and those being incited in this way, uh, those who want to see a, a violent overthrow of, of the Biden administration. Is, is that once we get past January 20th, if we can just strap in our seatbelts and get through it, is, are, are they going to start to fall away? Or is this something, this kind of movement, something we have to be concerned about in a growing way in the months and years to come? Well, the first line of defense, uh, which may or may not be successful, is gonna be the Republican leadership themselves. And it's gonna be Mitch McConnell. Uh, and that's why I believe he, he should both convict Donald Trump. Uh, what we need to do is separate out the people who are diehard conservatives, uh, but committed to the constitution. I might disagree with them about abortion or about how I interpret the second amendment or a range of different issues, uh, uh, but, uh, people who still respect the Constitution and who do not believe in resorting to violence and get those people back into the Republican Party with the understanding they're playing by the rules. The people who do not want to play by the rules, who want to engage in violence, are out. And the Democratic Party has been successful in this. I mean, there are people, not elected Democrats, but there are people who think that some of the violence this summer was okay. Uh, but they're not elected Democrats. They're not in the Democratic Party. They're not getting elected to high positions in the Democratic Party or any positions that I've seen. Uh, and in the 1960s, there were extremists, uh, Black Panthers and the rest of it. Uh, none of those groups were allowed into the mainstream civil rights movement uh, or into the Democratic Party. Uh, Martin Luther King's philosophy of nonviolence uh, has been uh, the, uh, the, the philosophy of the, in the United States uh, for how we achieve social change. And so if the Democratic Party could keep the, uh, the people who are violent, uh, uh, the very, very few on the left who are violent out of the uh, Democratic Party and adhere to the values of, of Martin Luther King and other uh, uh, great Americans, well, so can the Republicans and they can bring in arch conservatives. I'm fine with that, I disagree with them, but no more violence uh, or advocating of violence and also objective truth. We need people committed to objective truth and no more alternative facts. Uh, and Kellyanne Conway, I don't know what her future holds and, uh, but um, uh, I just don't think we need people like that anymore. So let's look at some of the questions from our audience. Uh, the first question that I have here is uh, related to what we've just been talking about, uh, which is the following. What are three things you think the Biden administration should do first to restore democracy? And what can we ordinary citizens do right now to bring our country together? Well, I, I believe President Biden uh, does need to appoint an independent counsel to look at everything that happened in the previous administration. Political appointees should not be doing that in the Biden administration. The political appointees should focus on the agenda going forward and uh, on uh, the rest of their job. But there does need to be uh, at least one, if not several, independent councils who are going to look at what happened. We cannot accept it. And, and this is a point that you made back in 2010 about the torture program in the, uh, in the Bush years, uh, which was one of the uh, really most tragic part of the, uh, of, the, um, of the Bush presidency. That should have been investigated fully in the Obama years, not by political appointees, but by an independent prosecutor uh, to determine who uh, committed acts that amounted to torture and who condoned it. John Yu, the lawyer who was a tenured law professor at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, a great embarrassment to the University of California who wrote those torture memos justifying torture. I mean, that should have been investigated, all of it. Uh, and unfortunately, the Obama uh, administration said, well, no, we're just going to look forward. We're in the middle of an economic, de uh, really a depression, uh, and they just want to look forward. But uh, that was a mistake, and we can't do that this time. Investigate what happened, hold people accountable, whether it's criminal or, or other findings, reverse a bunch of those Office of Legal Counsel memoranda. That ought to be a top priority in the uh, Biden Justice Department. Uh, and Merrick Garland is an excellent choice for Attorney General. Uh, he should have been on the Supreme Court back in 2016, but uh, uh, I won't get into that and how I feel about Mitch McConnell on that one. So uh, 
why is account, just to follow that up and before I go to the next question, why is accountability so important? What happens if you don't have accountability? Because no administration really wants to, to go in for accountability because they're focused on, on what they want to do now. Uh, but it, that you're really saying it to ignore, to go forward and not look backward is a, is a luxury we can't afford. No, we cannot. And uh, the looking back should not be done by political appointees. It should be an independent prosecutor. So they're the two separate tasks performed by different people. So it should not impede the political agenda at all. Uh, but uh, it's critically important because if people get away uh, with attempted sedition, uh, attempted coups, uh, we don't know, by the way, what happened in that White House meeting that we wrote that uh, blog post about. Um, uh, where they had Michael Flynn talking about sending the army into Pennsylvania and Georgia Invoking and redoing the, the election. election act yeah. Yeah. That needs to be investigated because that's sedition, uh, what happened there. Uh, and uh, if we tolerate that, uh, then they come back. And it happens again, maybe not the same people, but other people that do it. They say, well, that was okay. They got a pass. Maybe they didn't get to have their uh, uh, seditious coup, uh, but nobody got prosecuted for it. Uh, well, somebody else is going to try it in the future. And, and once again, I go back to the what were the lessons learned from that uh, beer hall putsch in 1923, when all, all uh, Hitler got was uh, eight months in the slammer uh, for trying to take over the whole government. Uh, well, that sends a message, that kind of thing's okay. And then he was back. Uh, so we, we, we do need to uh, investigate what happened uh, and who did what and hold people accountable. And I'll tell you, anybody who engaged in a coup attempt uh, really was planning to take over the United States government. That can be proven. I don't care who it is. We ought to get a lot more than eight months in the slammer. I think we've learned that lesson. Now, Congress really needs to consider passing a new independent counsel statute, though, don't you think? Because if we're going to rely on a, an independent counsel to conduct these highly sensitive, very contentious, politically contentious investigations, we had better make sure that they're protected, uh, that they can't be fired um, by the president, not that, not that Joe Biden would be inclined to or have any reason to, um, but also they have to be above the fray in terms of other political pressures. Yes, I believe so. Uh, the Congress should reenact the, uh, the independent counsel statute that was allowed to expire in 1998. We can make some changes around the edges so we don't have another Ken Starr situation where he's told he can investigate a, a um, Arkansas land deal and before you know it, he's investigating White House sex. But uh, we, could, we could redesign the independent counsel statute, but it should be passed again. It was upheld by the United States Supreme Court in the Morrison versus Olson case. Uh, so Congress should do that. Now, on the other hand, though, the Biden Justice Department can appoint an independent counsel uh, to investigate uh, the, uh, the Trump administration matters. I believe there ought to be another independent counsel appointed who, if there, if there are any controversies involving the Biden administration, who would handle those. And uh, there'd just be a commitment the president wouldn't fire the independent counsel. And I don't think Joe Biden would because he doesn't have any criminal exposure. Uh, and uh, he's just not going to do that. So until we get the statute enacted, I'd be uh, perfectly happy with an executive order from the president appointing uh, maybe not one, but several independent counsel officers to look at politically sensitive matters in certainly the Trump administration. And if anything ever comes up in the Biden administration, uh, then they can handle hand that to the uh, independent counsel too. Good. A uh, couple more comments and questions from the audience. One person writes in that it was Rudy Giuliani who said that trial by combat before the January 6th assault on the cap, who said trial by combat before the January 6th assault on the Capitol. Uh, that may be not Donald Trump. Uh, that would be a reason, I suppose, to take a look at Giuliani's role in, uh, in furthering the incitement. Yeah, we can go back and look at the tapes. I mean, I think both of them and some others were really encouraging a very violent approach to this whole thing. And uh, it, it, once again, we just have the taste of what they said publicly, uh, but also uh, the, what did they know about that crowd and what that crowd intended to do when they encouraged them to march on the Capitol. And that was clear the plan to go to the Capitol. And uh, if they knew that those people needed to try and get into the Capitol, they knew they were sending them there to commit violence. 
Another question, when just this person says, when Justice Sotomayor walked through the audience after her book talk at the Free Library, I shook her hand and said, I hope you can bring this presidency to a speedy and peaceful conclusion. Is there a potential role for the Supreme Court in the coming days, weeks, and months? Well, I worried about that, uh, that the Supreme Court would get pulled into this. And the Supreme Court would have been pulled into it if it been a lot closer and we'd had another Bush versus Gore uh, where the Supreme Court was pulled in. And uh, I, I think that was, uh, even though I supported President Bush in that campaign, I think that was an unfortunate decision. Uh, they should have just done the, you know, done the recount. A lot of people think it probably would have come out the same way, but we can all argue about that. It would have been much better for the Supreme Court not to get involved in the Bush versus Gore thing, let Florida figure it out. Uh, but because of what happened in Bush versus Gore, a lot of the Trumpers were thinking, gee, if it's, if it's close, they could drag the federal courts in. And it wasn't even close at all. And they still tried to drag the Supreme Court in and the federal courts by filing frivolous briefs of about 50 separate cases. I think a bunch of those lawyers ought to get sanctioned under Rule 11 and Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and the state rules. Uh, but uh, this nonsense, uh, uh, I believe, was dispensed uh, uh, with pretty quickly in the Supreme Court. And because it wasn't at all close like Bush versus Gore, you didn't get the 5 4 split, uh, that type of a thing that the Trump people were hoping for. They did get involved just enough to send the Pennsylvania case uh, back to Pennsylvania courts twice, in fact, and say, we're not going to get involved in this. Once before Amy Coney Barrett was on the court, and once after, in which she declined to, to vote on the case. Um, but it does seem as though the court was pretty firmly on the side of letting the states run their own elections and letting state courts determine the outcome to any debated election points under state law. Well, absolutely. And the difference between this and Bush versus Gore, though, is that there weren't even any legitimate issues under state law. And it's all made up on the Trump side. I mean, you can't possibly come up with a theory where Trump wins Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, it, it just doesn't doesn't work, uh, no matter how you do the math. Even if you throw out the votes of the people who vote in Pennsylvania, whose ballots came in late, uh, and there's a big fight about that, the votes that came in after election day, but mail before, even if you threw all those out, I think Trump still loses Pennsylvania. Uh, so the whole thing, uh, it just wasn't even close. And these, yet these lawyers are going to court and arguing this complete nonsense. Uh, so this this time around, they weren't able to bring in the in the federal courts. But I agree strongly with the proposition that there ought to be no interference from the courts. And I, I think the approach in Bush versus Gore was the incorrect approach. And the Supreme Court ought to back off from that and make it clear they're not doing another Bush versus Gore. That they, they would do that differently, and then you wouldn't get all these phony cases in the federal courts, at least. Will there be a conflict in obtaining evidence for, excuse me, and trying the president in the Senate and doing likewise in criminal prosecutions of him and others? So what, what about, let me repeat that, do we expect that there'll be a difficulty obtaining evidence uh, for criminal, for uh, the impeachment? Will we be able to hear witnesses? Why don't we start with that? Well, uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, there are going to be parallel investigations, and that's why the independent counsel is so critical, because we need to have the, the, the criminal investigation. And the Justice Department is already investigating uh, and has already made arrests with respect to what happened on the 6th of January. Uh, but uh, there need to be investigations, both in the Department of Justice and in Congress, uh, focusing not just on impeachment, uh, but on, for example, members of Congress who may have been aware of this and participated and assisted in this. Uh, there needs to be widespread investigation to get to the bottom of this. What happened? And yes, we can call witnesses, uh, and uh, whether it's in a criminal investigation or a hearing. Uh, I hope it is not politicized uh, and that the Republicans aren't standing in the way of investigations. Uh, I hope that a good portion of this will be undertaken in the Justice Department, though, uh, so that uh, those investigations be carried out without all the circus. I mean, the problem with the, in Congress, I've testified up there uh, about eight, nine times, is that they spend most of their time talking uh, or attacking each other. 
uh, and I had that at the uh, hearing we had just last September about the post office. I mean, they, they were going on and on attacking each other and attacking the witnesses. And the amount of time the witness actually gets to say anything is, is, is very little. Uh, so these hearings uh, are really only the beginning of what a proper investigation is. But I would say it's critical that if this impeachment is going to be meaningful at all, Given that Donald Trump will be out of office, one of the most important things is that we would be able to hear witnesses and see evidence uh, so that at least we get some transparency. We have absolutely. I'm sorry, go on. No, absolutely right. We, we, we need transparency. The public, uh, public is entitled to know what happened and who was behind it. Another question. Um, I was hoping that Professor Painter could address the influence of Christian nationalism and the drive for theocracy in connection with the recent right-wing move towards authoritarianism. I know you have some views about that. I don't see anything Christian about nationalism. And uh, I mean, I, I'm a Christian. I've been involved in the Christian churches my whole life. And this idea that, uh, uh, that somehow the Christian faith is tied to uh, nationalism and uh, the superiority of certain nations over others. Uh, you know, once again, uh, we've gone through this. Uh, th there was a lot of that going on in Germany in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, uh, a lot of the clergy stood up against it. But there were clergy of both the Protestant and the Catholic Church who went along with a variation on the theme of Christian nationalism. Uh, but it's not Christian at all. Uh, it, there's no biblical support. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, that's something that needs to be taken on in the churches. I mean, the Pope needs to crack down on any of that kind of stuff going on on the Catholic side and in the Protestant churches, uh, uh, we need to get rid of it. Uh, it. It's very, very dangerous. And it leads to, uh, it spills over to anti-Semitism and a lot of other things that are, have, been, have had very tragic consequences in the past. Uh, so this whole religious right thing uh, needs to be revisited. Uh, you know, they're going to be people who think their uh, uh, religious views dictate certain views on one side of the, you know, maybe the abortion argument or the other. I mean, I know very uh, religious people on both sides of that argument. Um, but uh, when it's taken to this extreme, uh, uh, what's going on in the United States today, the religious right, it, 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 it's horrific. And by the nope. way, there's an awful lot of hypocrisy. I mean, look at this uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. guy down there in, in the Liberty University and running around with a pool boy. I mean, that was just a, 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 an embarrassment. I, I hope Donald Trump, the, the whole Trump experience leads the Republican Party to revisit its relationship with these extremist elements. One of the uh, really interesting backstories about the uh, nomination of Amy Coney Barrett uh, is the role that right-wing, uh, mostly Catholics, have, have played in trying to get a person like Justice um, Amy Coney Barrett into the court and the level of effort, the relationship uh, between those groups and the Federalist Society. Um, talk a little bit about that and uh, the extraordinary fact that we now have, I think, six Catholic members of the Supreme Court. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, the, the key person at the Federal Society is named Leonard Leo. He's been there for decades. He's been very much involved in judicial selection in Republican administrations. Uh, and uh, uh, that has, uh, has led uh, to a, a desire to bring in the religious right. That's where uh, Leonard Leo's connections are. Uh, the religious right has two groups that used to be at odds with each other, uh, Catholic, far-right Catholics and far-right evangelical Protestants, uh, who used to dislike each other a great deal until they figured out that they could get together and push a certain agenda on abortion or gay rights or whatever, parents' schools and so forth, aid for pro government aid for parochial schools and the rest of it. And this agenda has been pushed in a, in a very big way. Uh, and uh, what's interesting though about this group in the United States, uh, particularly on the Catholic side, is that they do not reflect uh, the theology of the Catholic Church. A lot of these people 
you give them a couple of drinks and they start complaining about the Pope. They were fine with the last Pope, but the current Pope, he talks about helping the poor and things like that too much. Uh, and they're upset with him. Uh, and they also don't like the fact that the American Catholic Church increasingly has uh, more and more Hispanics uh, as part of the Catholic Church. Uh, they don't like that. Uh, so this is a, a, a small group of people who are not representative of uh, global Catholicism or American Catholicism. I say this as, as a Protestant. I, I find that this is, is shocking uh, that you can have a, a, a far right group purport to speak for an entire church. I will also say that uh, Justice Sotomayor is a, uh, is a uh, committed Catholic and she, uh, uh, she has a lot of things to say uh, that, that might be a little bit closer to um, what the Pope's talking about. Uh, than, uh, than some of the stuff, at least I read in uh, Amy Coney Barrett's Law of the Articles. And of course, Catholicism has a long tradition of, of social justice activism as well. And, and yet that's not the, the aspect of Catholicism that we see asserting itself here with regard to, to judicial picks. Not with a far right wing, with, a, with the exception. So once again, I, I think of Justice Sotomayor and, and their uh, I clerked for Judge John Noonan of the Ninth Circuit, who was very, um, uh, I disagreed with him on, on abortion, but he was very um, uh, forward leaning on trying to protect the rights of immigrants and the way immigrants are treated at the borders. These detention centers and what goes on there is much worse under Donald Trump, but it's been a problem for 20 or 30 years. Uh, and uh, there's been a strong movement uh, among religious groups. Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, other groups to, uh, uh, and, and, and secular humanists uh, to address that. So we need a country where we come back to our fundamental values uh, as human beings. We have different religious uh, persuasions, uh, but the, the notion of letting a, a small group of extreme people purport to speak for an entire denomination uh, in the church or for a political party uh, those days need to come to an end. And that's what we write about in American Nero in this book about those social trends where extremist groups try to take over established institutions uh, to push their own agenda. And it's a, it's a very dangerous thing. I'd like now to ask a question where I'm gonna identify the questioner because he's a member of our, uh, the Searle Executive Board, uh, retired General Joseph Botel, who says, a uh, great discussion. What do, you t what do you tell young people to help them have confidence in our form of government and especially in our national institutions that seem to be coming apart, the executive branch, Congress, and our political parties? I would tell uh, younger people uh, uh, that just watch what happens on next Wednesday, uh, next, uh, Wednesday when President uh, Biden is sworn in. This system works. It broke down once into violence, uh, uncontrollable violence in the Civil War. Uh, that's a history of nearly 250 years. Uh, it, we've had riots and various other disturbances. Uh, we, this is the first time ever we had an invasion of the Capitol building by seditionists. Uh, but the bottom line is that we, we get through it. And uh, we have a strong uh, judicial system, a legal system, and a strong military. And I respect uh, uh, General Votel, others in the military uh, who have taught uh, the right values uh, to those uh, who are under them in the military and the, the values of supporting the democracy that the, the United States military is not there to serve the president. He may be commander in chief, but they are sworn to defend the constitution. And that's the message that was sent by the Joint Chiefs of Staff just this last week that they're there to defend the Constitution. Uh, and uh, the institutions work in the United States. And I hope in our law schools that we can, uh, we can teach that, and emphasize that. I've had enough of, of uh, uh, people getting up in front of a classroom or a lecture hall and saying that all law is is politics, uh, that there's no objective truth. Uh, I mean, that's been preached by uh, the far left uh, recently, but it all comes from uh, Karl Schmidt, a German a legal philosopher who pushed Nazism, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea uh, that law is somehow just dictated by politics is anathema uh, to a civilization such as ours. Uh, I, I see a bright future, uh, but we have an obligation, uh, those of us of the older generation, 
uh, uh, to talk about uh, the rule of law in a respectful way and, and uh, not to succumb to cynicism uh, and uh, uh, notions of relative truth, uh, uh, teaching people to avoid the law, you know, getting around the law. We've had a lot of that. You know, how do you avoid the law and, you know, and, and, and dance around laws and, you know, law is somehow a, um, is something to be toyed with. Uh, we saw a lot of that under Bill Barr over the past uh, uh, two years in the Justice Department. And those aren't the values we're going to teach our students. Uh, and uh, we're going we're gonna to make this country stronger. Well, and that was, of course, very much the way the Department of Justice, uh, right after 9-11, thought about law because it was a, a tool to justify the use of torture uh, rather than a dispassionate uh, assessment and normative standard to live up to, uh, to tell us when we were going off the rails, what we could do in the war on terror, and what was actually legitimate. Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the notion that there's somehow no objective standard uh, by which we can measure human behavior, uh, and whether it's right or wrong, uh, is absolutely absurd. And it is certainly that view uh, should not uh, be present uh, in the Justice Department, on the courts, or in the legal profession, or in the law schools. Uh, if people want to talk about uh, the rule of laws, if it's somehow to be uh, uh, just related to power politics, that's one uh, very perverse theory. And the other is that, well, it's a fun game to work your way around the law. And that's what Bill Barr did. And we go through that in that report uh, the Searle uh, and uh, the crew report that we uh, published last October, all the games getting around the law and that that's somehow what lawyers are supposed to do. And, and that needs to come to an end. And that report, by the way, can be found on the Searle homepage uh, on the left-hand side of the page. Now we have about uh, nine minutes left. So let me see if I can go through a bunch of these questions a little more quickly so I can uh, give as many people a say as, as possible. Uh, one person asked, do you really believe that McConnell respects democracy? Why did he wait until an attempted coup to repudiate Trump? Why didn't he push back starting in November? Does he respect democracy or is he Machiavellian? Oh, he's Machiavellian, all right. But I think he may have learned his lesson. Those two Georgia Senate seats, uh, he's lost his leadership position and all his buddies have lost their chairmanships. And the Republicans would have had both of those seats, certainly one of them, if Donald Trump had acted halfway decently about losing the election. Uh, but uh, Trump uh, uh, goes and uh, tries to uh, incite uh, you know, violence. And, and Trump also, he called the Secretary of State of Georgia and tried to uh, solicit election fraud. Well, the voters of Georgia didn't appreciate it. So uh, Mitch McConnell is someone who has to learn the hard way. Uh, but now, if they don't put an end to Trumpism, uh, the Trumpism is going to be uh, hanging over the Republican Party for the next decade or more. And it's going to drag them down in the polls. And they're going to lose more Senate seats. And uh, the American people are tired of it. One of the interesting things about Mitch McConnell's position right now is that he has every interest in not pissing off the Democrats because there's going to be a sharing of power with 50-50 uh, in the Senate. Uh, Technically, the uh, Democrats will control <clears throat> as though they were uh, in the majority within the Senate because of the deciding vote of Kamala Harris as vice president. Uh, but when we've been in this, the few instances in which we've been in this position before, uh, deals have been struck about how many members of each party serve on the committees and who the committee chairs are. You think that McConnell is, is sounding more like a rule of law guy these days uh, because he's thinking about those deals? Yes, that's the way Mitch McConnell thinks. He likes to make deals. And, and Senator Schumer will make some deals with him, but Senator Schumer is not going to be selling out either. I mean, the, the American people decided and uh, uh, the vice president has the uh, deciding vote in the Senate. Uh, and that's the way it's going to be. Now, if Mitch McConnell wants to uh, cooperate here and uh, uh, you know, certainly hold Donald Trump accountable, that would be a good start uh, for the Republicans trying to rebuild a credible conservative uh, party. Uh, and as I say, to win future elections on a national scale, they're gonna have to bring in some moderates 
as well. But this idea of resorting to violence and to conspiracy theories and extremist groups, uh, that has to be a thing of the past. Okay, here's a great question. Can presidential pardons ever be reversed if they are done in service of a crime? Most notably, we might say obstruction. That's a fascinating question. First, if there is a presidential pardon given in order to obstruct justice, uh, I would say that the, um, uh, that the presidential pardon itself is a crime uh, committed by the president and anyone who assisted the president in receiving, in, in issuing the pardon. Now the question would be, is the receipt of the pardon itself a crime and a crime that took place after the pardon? Remember, I said that prospective pardons would not be valid if the crime takes place after the pardon. So if the pardon is issued to, let's say, hypothetically, a man named Roger Stone in return for his not testifying, which is an obstruction of justice, and then Roger Stone accepts the pardon, understanding he's not going to testify. Of course, now, of course, he can be forced to testify. Uh, but all future crimes, including the receipt of the pardon itself, uh, might very well be prosecutable crimes. So even if the pardon is valid and is not revoked, the pardon holder ha has a lot of problems on his hands. Here's a great question uh, that serves a little bit of, uh, as a challenge, I think, to the idea that a sitting president can be indicted. Uh, does that give the state attorney generals incentive or power to bring frivolous indictments, just as we've seen frivolous lawsuits in the aftermath of the election? Uh, we went through that in the uh, brief that was submitted to the United States Supreme Court uh, on behalf of, of Searle in, um, in March. Uh, that you know, anything could be a possibility, but there are a lot of controls in place with respect to uh, uh, prosecutors and prosecutorial ethics. Uh, so that, that's the first thing. Uh, second, uh, a president uh, would not necessarily be subject to trial. That's a different question. You could have an indictment, but a trial might not take place until after the president leaves the presidency. It would depend on the burden to the president, say, and other factors. And if it were a weak indictment, uh, that it would be a factor to be taken into account by the courts as well. Uh, so there are a number of different controls over this hypothetical prosecutorial abuse. Uh, uh, you know, and I know there's at least one, I think, Republican member of the House is already talking about trying to impeach Joe Biden for something, I don't know. Uh, and that people may try and cook up something, uh, but they, uh, I think that prosecutors aren't going to be able to get away with frivolous charges against the president. And the courts are there to handle that type of thing. And by the way, what's special about the president? I mean, if that's true, people would do it to the Speaker of the House, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, or anybody else uh, uh, could be uh, uh, targeted with harassing criminal charges. And we, we haven't had that parade of horribles happen. Uh, and I don't or see in the future. We have a terrific question about, uh, several questions about the 14th Amendment and section three of the 14th Amendment. Should it be invoked immediately to preclude Trump from running for office again? I would invoke it, yes. I think that's, uh, uh, the, the, the clause of the 14th Amendment there was aimed at the people who participated in the rebellion and the Civil War. Uh, and uh, basically he says that if, you know, I don't have the language here right in front of me, but if you participate in rebellion against the United States, uh, 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 you know, you cannot uh, be eligible to hold any public office. And I believe there are going to be a number of individuals, and that could very well include Donald Trump, who would be disqualified from holding public office under the 14th Amendment, whether or not there is a guilty verdict of impeachment in the Senate, which is a separate issue. And I have a number of uh, people asking about the downside of subjecting a president to a trial if you were to allow a trial, though you've said you need not. Um, of course, there's a statute of limitations issue there, but, but that we all know that President Clinton, for example, uh, one person writes, had to spend time dealing with the Paula Jones matter while he was president. Um, are there reasons to worry about getting a president bogged down? And then 
what about the tolling of the statute of limitations if we say that a sitting president cannot be subject to legal process? Well, the first uh, issue, uh, you know, what kind of uh, a potential harassment there can be is something the courts uh, can control. And we ought to rely on the courts control. And I, I know that the Clinton situation got out of hand. Now that's partially uh, President Clinton's own fault. He didn't need to engage in the conduct to begin with. And, and second, he didn't need to lie about it. Uh, and uh, he, so he got himself into an awful lot of that. Uh, now that being said, uh, the investigations did get out of hand, particularly the special prosecutor investigation by Ken Starr. They were supposed to get into a, the Whitewater land deal and then he's investigating the, 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 the perjured testimony. It was perjury in, in the um, Clinton Paul v. Uh, Jones case. And then before you know it, it's uh, talking about Monica Lewinsky and uh, uh, Ken Starr had his young lawyer there, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, draft a pretty disgusting list of questions who are supposed to be asked of President Clinton. Uh, and uh, that's all online. I won't repeat it. And you have a polite audience here. But uh, it really, uh, it got out of hand. Uh, but uh, that's what judges are there for. I mean, Judge Starr should have been reined in. And his fellow colleagues, I guess, as he used to be on the DC circuit. Uh, they didn't seem to want to rein him in and uh, tell him and, and Brett Kavanaugh and the rest of them to cool their jets on that. Uh, there are ways to control uh, out of uh, uh, you know politicized investigations and the rest of it without a, a blanket rule that the president can't be indicted or investigated while in office. Because if you go that route, we're right back where I was talking about about an hour ago. You could have a president uh, who, in order to stay in office, commits any crime he wants. I mean, calls the Secretary of State of Georgia and says, "Come up with give me thirteen thousand votes." Calls the President of Ukraine and says, "Hey, investigate my opponent." And then, you know, the end of the road on that, as they say, is, is the, the Vladimir Putin approach. Uh, we can't live in a country like that where president can do anything he wants in office without fear of criminal investigation or indictment. Richard, I'm going to suggest that we convey, uh, there are so many wonderful questions here. I've only skimmed the surface of them. Uh, I'm going to suggest that I convey these questions to you. And if you'd like to answer some of them on Twitter, uh, I bet people would love to hear, but let me ask you one last question, uh, which should be a short one for you. Would you serve in the Biden administration if asked? I, I would be happy to help uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, President uh, Biden, soon to become President Biden, if there were an appropriate role for me to, uh, to help the, the president. Uh, there are a lot of uh, very, very good people out there who are eager to help put this country on the right track. Uh, and uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris are going to have a lot of excellent people to choose from. So I'm, I'm very confident where we're going forward here on this. Well, let's hope they call you. And thank you so much for a fabulous book talk. We could go on forever. Uh, I will get those questions for you. And uh, everyone should consider buying uh, this fabulous book, which is more timely than ever. What a week we picked to discuss it. Uh, and thank you, Richard, so much for being with us. Thank you so much. And thank you to uh, everyone and uh, so for hosting this. And uh, I look forward to uh, next Wednesday, a new beginning for the United States. And please follow us on Twitter, uh, Searle, and you can follow me on Twitter and, and Richard Painter as well. Take care and have a good night. Mm -hmm.